<laughs> well, hello, folks, and welcome to episode 153 of Retro Power and Cut. And you join me in the fabrication shop, which is quite a hive of activity at the moment. It's all going on. The first uh, place we have Rich down here, he is doing some more home improvements here on the sort of scabby bits of the building. We're uh, trying to, we've moved our metal storage, which I mentioned before, into that rack over there. And Rich is now trying to make this wall look less of a, less of a tip. Now we've moved all the metal away from it, we realise how scabby it all looked. So he's uh, trying, to, try, trying, to, trying to do some improvements and make the place look a bit more ship shape. Uh, moving on from that, we're on Churchill Jaguar and Tom is doing some of the welding on the exhaust system. The principal progress on this has been exhaust this week. Uh, Stu's been working on getting all the fit up done on that. On the final parts, he's pretty much getting there now. He's just working on the two over axle sections at the moment and working out the curves for that. Um, the radius on the 90 degree bends is too, uh, they're too sharp. We could obviously go to a slacker bend to get that, but as I said to Stu, it's actually probably better to split the bend and lengthen, uh, split it halfway and lengthen the bend. It gives us a bit more adjustment uh, above the drive shaft area so that we've got a better chance of getting the pipe work through. So Stu's working on the, uh, the fit up for, for that area and Tom's now getting the, the, all the sections that Stu's got all tacked up and fitted up. Just Tom's just getting the final welds done on that uh, and getting those bits in place. Tom's also been doing the final couple of bits of the um, sort of main bits of metal finishing. Uh, the last major area was getting the roof section to fit and the, uh, the top of the windscreen. We got a bit of a drop in the roof across the top of the windscreen. And he's just been getting that sorted out. Uh, it meant just splitting the flange slightly there and raising that. For some reason, there's a deviation in the roof. Um, and it seemed to be a deviation in the actual width of the flange in the recess. So we've just split that, moved that up slightly and re-welded that just to get the roof line right around the uh, windscreen aperture. So he's got that sorted. So exhaust's pretty much getting there now. That's pretty close. Uh, and I think once that's done, we've got a little revisit on the transmission oil cooler. We've decided the lines are too close to the exhaust to be done in flexible line. Um, they, were, they were fairly close. We thought we could just heat shield it. We've decided actually that's not a good idea. Everything's just too close. And you know, ATF line leaking onto an exhaust pretty much going to be an instant car on fire moment. So we're going to hard, we're going to hard line those. We didn't want to have to do that, but we are going to hard line those transmission uh, cooler lines now. So that's, uh, so once, Stu's, once Stu and Tom have got the exhaust finished off, then we can drop the exhaust down and get on getting the transmission cooler lines finished well redone basically i think we'll make those up in uh, in hard line and then put uh, then they'll have uh, compression fittings on uh, to terminate them at the transmission and at the, then to flexi line at the front to go to the cooler so that's where we're at on that moving along reversing my way along here we now have the next redux project uh, in progress so that's now on the jig. That's been waiting in the wings for uh, while we've just been getting in a position to be able to get that on the jig. It's now on the jig. It's all gone onto the jig OK. There's been no significant problems there. It's a very straight shell. Um, it, yeah, all, all, all as good as expected, really. There's some very, very minor damage on this shell um, on the radiator surround. Uh, but that'll be sorted out. There'll be a little bit of panel work to do there, but nothing major at all. Uh, all, the, all the jig fixtures have gone basically straight on. As much as they always do, there's always a little bit of tweaking and working out the order of doing bolts up, but nothing too drastic there. And certainly, uh, certainly all entirely straight, no accident damage, no, no problems there. So yeah, it's on to basically panel removal. The next phase, Scott's kind of running the, uh, running the show on this one. Uh, and the, 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 the next phase is basically de-paneling it, getting all the steel panel work off uh, and getting it all prepared so that it's in a position that the carbon panel work could go on mocking up the carbon panel work with all the various sections to allow that to be bonded and then all of the other metal work and uh, there's, a, there's a lot of metal work in these projects it's a lot of it is not really visible it's very easy to look at the finished result and think mm, yes it's an e30 yeah it's not <laughs> there's an awful lot of modification 
uh, but under the skin on that. So uh, you'll, you'll be able to sort of see that going along in the background as we, uh, as we go. Uh, moving on from that one, brief, only a brief touch on that one. Next is the E-Type and Sam's been working, I'm gonna bustle my way through here actually. Sam's been working on the transmission tunnel. I can sort of gesticulate in that direction. There's probably not much uh, point in sort of uh, in pointing too much. It's pretty obvious what's been going on. There's, uh, <laughs> somebody's been putting rude messages on it. But, uh, yeah, Sam's been getting on with the uh, transmission tunnel. That's coming along nicely. Uh, it's quite awkward to get everything close enough to the transmission and so that we maximise the space for the seats in the car, um, but also have enough clearance around the transmission to get the cooler lines in and all that side of things. So yeah, things are, things are progressing well there. Um, in fact, I'm gonna elaborate slightly on how this was made. Um, here's a little uh, bit that might be of interest to, uh, to people involved. Obviously this is a conical, a conical section and making a cone in metal is a pretty, pretty reasonably straightforward piece of metal. But the complicated bit of this is the rear part, obviously. That's where some time's been taken because the shape becomes much more complicated there. It is single curvature, it's not compound curvature, but it's single curvature in, different, in various planes, which is where it's become complicated, actually getting it, uh, actually getting it all fabricated. But the, the, the curvature of the, the actual single curvature cone section is an interesting point in that there are a number of ways of making a cone, most people familiar with sheet metal work will be familiar with the ability of using a set of um, pyramid rolls, a set of slip rolls, to, to make a cone um, by setting the rolls different on one end to the other. You roll the cone through and the piece of metal slips at one end, doesn't at the other, and you roll the cone. It's quite hard if you're working to, if you, it, it's, it's quite hard to do it that way basically for a number of reasons. For one, none of our rollers have any side rollers on them. So the, the sheet slides across and then basically you have to improvise some sort of shoe on the side of the rollers for it to slide on. And also it's quite hard to control the radius on both ends. And also where you want a straight section at the bottom of the cone, as you can see where, that, where it meets the floor on this, you, it's quite hard to work out the point where you stop rolling on the rolls and where you start rolling on the rolls basically to get the, to get the final shape. And having done it plenty of times, it, it's easy to get into quite a muddle. And what we find is, an actual, is actually a better way of making a conical section like that is actually to use the English wheel. We use a, a, a polyurethane tired caster for the upper wheel. Um, as the rubber wheel and then that basically turns the English wheel from a machine for forming compound curves which as you'll recall from me waffling on before is achieved by stretching the metal and forcing it uh, to the sides making it grow in area which makes it gain crown rather than doing that it turns it into just a bending machine where you're actually bending the steel over the lower the anvil roller using the rubber top wheel as a, as a flexible former I've got actually I've got a bit of sheet uh, handily under here. I'll just quickly show you on the wheel what I'm what I'm talking about. This is a bit of an aside on an uncut. It wasn't really very planned, so I'm making life tricky for Jamie here. But Sam's got the wheel somewhere near actually already, so I should be able to demonstrate it. So we've got a we've got a. Mm, I can't even remember what radius wheel this is, and I'm not going to bother going in and bother elaborating. But basically, a radius bottom wheel, as you would normally have on an English wheel for wheeling in a in a in a corner on something. So we've got that on the bottom, and then this large rubber caster on the top. If I wind that up, wind that up, so we've got a bit of contact. So basically, we start with the part, and if I want to put it, it'll be a single curvature in this piece. I can just put that through there. As you'll see, it'll just bend it straight over the over the wheel, over the um, bottom bottom wheel. But what you can do is do it much more gently than that, so I can actually create quite a gentle curve. A little bit more pressure, so I can just make. If I'm making a transmission tunnel or something, I can do this quite gently. And it won't create a compound curve; it'll create a single curve, and it's then very easy to create whatever shape you want quite with quite moderate effort and very quickly so I can just generate a generic curve like that the benefit is I can then do that I can taper that curve really easily if I want to make it a if I need the, the, the curve to carry on in some other shape I'm not explaining it very well but it'll be obvious at that end I can then bring that curve out round at the ends just gives me the ability to curve a piece of steel in, in, in a single curvature 
really quickly in a really controlled fashion that's just a lot easier to set up and a lot less messing about than using the uh, using the pyramid rolls or the slip rolls now the obviously i've just done that roughly so there's lines in it if it's done very gently there won't be any lines in it at all it's just a really neat way of making transmission tunnels so thought i'd thought i'd explain that bit as a little bit of an aside just as an explanation of how sam's actually done the job on there obviously he's done it with a bit more precision than i just have that was just a, a speedy demonstration so yeah that's pretty much where sam's at with that there's been quite a lot of um thinking forwards and backwards on that and there's been a bit of time in working out getting the handbrake in place uh getting the working out where the seats are going to go where the seat cross members going to go where the transmission cross members going to go so there's been quite a lot of thinking time involved with that as well as doing the actual tunnel uh, he's now templating the front section of that to make the sheet metal up for the for the forward section where that joins the rest of the bulkhead. So <clears throat> that's where Sam's at at the minute on that. He's uh, he's just progressing on on that section. Moving on from that, we'll come on to the Integra Allegro Allegretto, whatever we'd like to call it. Um, we uh, we still haven't got a name for this one, so we'll uh, I don't I don't believe anyway. So we'll we'll keep calling it all sorts of things. But as you can see, Bobby's got the uh, the uh, Allegro body shell up in the air. You can see the uh, quantity of Allegro involved by uh, by by the uh, by the impression here. Now Bobby's been working on the, um, <clears throat> the inner sill, the rear section of the inner sills was his most recent part. He's been finishing off the sills, he's been working on the rear of the boot floor. We can uh, probably wander around that way and I can probably point at it. Yes, because this looks like it's awaiting final welding. So he's been working on the closing off section for the rear of the spare wheel well. This was the modification, it's basically the same as was done on the other car. Um, made it made in various pieces center section and then two pieces and two pieces each side because getting that curvature in on a single piece makes the part rather challenging so it's split on that radius there just makes it a lot easier to make so he's got that lot in he started fully welding he's going to finish the tig welding round there and get all that finished off so that's where we're at on that bit he's got to make the the rear piece that fills between this and the back of the boot on the allegro but that's done once the shell's fitted so the next phase on from that is finishing the scuttle work, which Bobby has also been on with. He's made the, I made about a 10 minute start, no, slightly more than that, but I made a very brief start on it and then got wrapped up in other work as I do. So Bobby's just picked up where I the, did a few minutes and left off and uh, finished cutting out the rear section of the uh, scuttle extension and the vertical section of the scuttle extension he's got them just looking in the shell now he's got the vertical section all spot welded into the scuttle um the, the bottom of the windscreen section on the allegro and he's got the horizontal part of that spot welded into the integra working alongside him at that point before he moved on to the bmw uh, scott was working on the forward set finishing off the a pillars and then well, the finishing off the mock-up on the April. There's none of that can be welded until the shell's on, but finishing off making up the sections for it uh, and finished off the spouts. I think I mentioned them last week. Scott's also finished off these, uh, the water spouts each side where the scuttle drains, the, water, the rainwater drains into the scuttle, drains out through here. Once this is all boxed in, these come out through the side so the rainwater can come out without filling the structure of the car up. Um, and then Scott's carried on and done, made all the forward section of the scuttle uh, including the hatches, the access hatches for getting at the wiper mechanism and generally just getting in there for paint access and all that side of things because it's quite an awkward area to coat. Obviously before the shell goes on all of that's going to be epoxy coated in there anyway and seam sealed before we can do the final assembly and welding on that. So uh, yeah, Scott, that's where Scott left off getting that um, forward section of the scuttle done prior to moving on to the BMW. So Bobby's now working on these, getting this rear section of the sill all built. Um, there's a few little complications around there and this lot has to be boxed in. There's various bits of, as you can see, the shape becomes a little bit more elaborate there on our new sill reinforcers. This is the, what we call the inner sill. There's obviously the vertical section of the inner sill. Then that's epoxy coated. This section is made up in two pieces with a spreader plate in the middle there, which we, as you can see these spot welds here. Then all of that is then also epoxy coated. And then the epoxy coating is removed on the flanges and that's all spot welded. And it's an awful lot of spot welds going on there. I know James, <laughs> he's got a lot of spot weld footage. There's a lot of spot welds gone into that. That's all done. And then the outer sill sections, which are lurking over there, which I'll grab one of. Oops, demonstrate what goes on there. That's the outer sill section, which is done in 16 gauge steel. So what, what is one and a half millimeter thick steel with a spreader plate in the center section again, because uh, they're done in two piece. We can't fold the length and we wanted to put a joint point in them anyway for another reason. Um, 
and yeah, they're done in one and a half mil thick, epoxy coated on the inside. Again, as you can see, Bobby's just sort of tried to leave the flanges clean. We'll give them a little abrade before it's spot welded and they'll be covered in, uh, they'll be just sprayed with weld through primer, a zinc, zinc rich weld through primer before these are spot welded on. These have to then be fitted. This is the other side, actually. The join is actually on the rear. So the join's basically in line with, the, well, roughly in line with the door shut point. Um, but the, uh, these, will be, these are going to be spot welded into the Allegro half of the body shell. And then these then go over. These will just spread enough to get over this. And these are spot welded. Uh, it, it, wrong way around, as I say. This is the wrong side of the car. These basically spot weld over there. These, in rough terms, these spot weld over there. But these will actually be attached to the Allegro shell at the point they're fitted. So that's the, the basics of what's going on there and the, the rough explanation of the structure. It's all quite heavy duty. We've added quite a lot of um, strength to the sill area on the grounds that the Integra was originally quite well reinforced in that area and the Allegro was hopelessly weak. The sills on the Allegro were just incredibly weak. So we wanted to add a lot of sort of beam strength to that part of the car on the grounds that we have lost some structure versus the original Integra design. Uh, and we want to just keep the car as strong as possible, make it a lot stronger than a, than a standard Allegro would have been. In parallel to all that, there's CAD work going on and various other excitement, which I'll uh, hand over to Cal to, uh, to show you. Um, but yeah, things are getting quite exciting on the bodywork front now. We're, we're, we're about to make some major steps forward there, so I'll let Cal, uh, I'll let Cal break the news on that. Um, I, the last bit on that was a tiny bit of work I've done on the front, which was just, you may have noticed in previous episodes, this, this was just roughly plasma cut off. When we, when we dismantled the front of the car, I literally just chopped that off with the plasma cut, hence all this rough, rough cutting around here. None of this matters. This, this, the front part of the inner wings, both sides here, are, these are removed. This is removed anyway, and this is changed anyway, so hence that, that rough cut doesn't matter. The rails were rough cut off slightly long. We just used a laser to establish the exact cutoff point, double checked it against the other car, double checked it against the panel fit up, uh, and then laser lined that through and cut the fronts off the rails dead on where they've got to be cut. So that then we can create the flanges that go on the front of these sections, which flange that all to the original front inner panel of the Allegro. So that's sort of, uh, that's pretty much where it needs to be now. So we're getting pretty close to the body, the Allegro body being able to go on for the first time, certainly next week, this should be merged with that two should become one for next week moving on from that we've got the uh, mark one escort kuma project uh, body shell which nothing very much has changed on this it's still awaiting the interior paint um the the, the situation on that is we're basically waiting to get that in the booth however the weather is so hot that at the moment trying to paint it is not going to be a good idea the temperatures are such that even with the heating off in the booth will be over 30 degrees almost immediately as soon as the blowers are on we're going to be over 30 degrees in there um, and that's just too hot for painting the, 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 the paint's not you know, it's, it's not suitable uh, weather for painting it's just, it's just too hot so we're waiting for that to cool down a bit we're also doing the booth refurb which I mentioned before we're actually awaiting the coating for the inside of the booth at the moment our um, paint supplier is out of stock of the peelable booth coatings so and we're actually stuck waiting for that as well at the moment fortunately we can carry on with the chevette so we're doing the final steps of prep on the chevette they're getting pretty close now it's just all the nitty gritty bits we're finding little edges and bits that weren't quite finished before so we're going through those now because um, this was sort of this had a temporary coat of right, you know, this 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 sort of minty green colour uh, was a, was just a, a coating put on it just to sort of hold it while it was stored. So and there's just a few bits of that where we've got with the little edges and bits that aren't quite prepped properly. So we're just going back through that, just making sure that's all good before final paint. Roof's been wet blocked. Everything, all the body sides are wet blocked now. Uh, the panels are now all in epoxy primer. They all need wet blocking. They've been wrapped on the inside um, the front wings. You can uh, see the inside of one of those. They're all uh, they've been wrapped on the, in, in the final colour on the inside now. So there's a that's the inside of one of the wings done in the final uh, final Raptor and lacquer coat, uh, which looks really nice and really tough, really resilient coating. So that's uh, that's done. So then these are being wet blocked. Obviously that one's been done. We've got a bonnet and another wing over there, uh, tailgate down there, which I'm not sure if that's done or not. I'm just looking at that now. No, that's not done yet. So that's still got to be wet blocked. And then also the final prep on the. Um, 
Martin Escort doors as well. They've been uh, going through final prep as well. So they're, uh, they're, they're basically ready for final paint as well. So yeah, all, uh, all, all, all pr progress on all fronts really. Everything's moving along nicely. So uh, yeah, hopefully, I, I don't like to say this because I'm actually quite enjoying the sun, but hopefully the weather just tones the temperature down a little bit in the next few days so that we can, uh, so, so that we can get the booth temperature down a little bit and actually get some paint put onto things. Um, and yeah, then we'll be, we'll be able to actually <laughs> get these two cars done. So yeah, I think that pretty much sums up where we're at on the uh, on the fabrication side of things and the uh, the body prep side of things. So at that point, I'll hand over to Cal and he'll enlighten you on where we're at on the uh, on the assembly shop front. So see you next time. Well, thank you, Nathaniel. Uh, I'm getting a Roundstone coffee in not a retro power mug because in the spur of the moment, I couldn't actually find one. So I've got my trusty old uh, Shell oil mug, but. Plenty of mugs available in the shop. So go ahead and buy one. Boy, I, never, I never think this coffee machine's slow when I just, just want to make a coffee, but when it's the beginning of the video, it's like... It's do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's blowing warm this week. And I will, I'll hear all of the viewers from Australia and the like going, that's not, that's not warm. That was a terrible accent, but uh, <laughs> it feels warm to me. Oh, it must be at least a whopping 27 degrees. All right, so uh, project one escort, uh, a couple of things on this. We've got some anodizing back. Uh, so we've got the components for the bonnet hinges on this one. So the, this is the other set, which is gonna go on project Kuma. The ones for this have been done black. Uh, last week we got back the bonnet latch parts from Bruce from lasering um, and we've now put them together and actually uh, what might be quite nice to show now is the little video that George did. So when George designed these, he designed all the components, we had them all machined and then as a guide for whoever was going to be building the car, he did a little kind of CAD exploded video, animated video of the parts. So. Uh, as a guidance for the person building the car, but quite useful to show you how it all works. So it's cool to see those on now and kind of how that slam panel area is going to look um, when, it, when it all comes together. So it's kind of getting to that exciting bit where we're starting to put uh, more and more shiny bits on. Um, and then Alex is working on the wiring. That's kind of the cornerstone now really to continuing the build of the car. So he's now finished the first section of the loom, which is engine ECU to bulkhead. So it's, a very, it's a, basically a three-legged loom. Part of it goes onto the engine ECU. There's the branch that comes out and connects into the main chassis harness. And then there's the part that goes to the bulkhead to a Deutsch Autosport connector. And then the engine harness will connect to that. So essentially the engine loom harness, whatever you want to call it, will come out in one piece and just be one connector onto the bulkhead. Um, so you can take that out. And then he is now working on the main chassis harness which is the the biggie which kind of goes to everything behind the dash all the instrumentation goes to the branch of the engine loom uh goes to the pdm so motec pdm uh all of the other components behind the dash uh also goes to the doors for the central locking motors the speaker wiring is all integrated into the chassis harness and then there's a, a, a mod there's a rear leg which is on a connector so then there's a, a rear leg which goes along has the connections to the amplifier which sits near the back, the connections to the can uh, communication for the battery isolator, the fuel pump, the rear lights, all that sort of thing. So, but it's on with the main, main chassis part, which is kind of the critical cornerstone really, that we need that in before we can get all the components of the dash together, um, before we can proceed with quite a few things. Um, so with that in mind, Anthony has now shifted over to sub-assembly builds for Project Kuma, which is kind of the sister car. Um, and that was, our intention has always been we staggered the builds when they came in but then during the build phase we were going to catch the two together or sort of bring the two back into line so they would be completed more or less together um, so what we're doing now is mindful of the fact that the kuma shell is getting very close to paint Anthony's now doing all the sub-assembly build work, so things like the rear subframe, I think he's pretty much finished that, it's just getting that together, he'll get the front subframe together, start getting all the sub-assemblies together, so when the Kuma shell's painted, that can be rolling, and that'll then catch up fairly quickly to the stage this one's at, because um, we can do everything that's been done to this one on that one. 
Um, and by that point, we should have the chassis harnesses built and we can get both of those together. And I think from that point onwards, they will more or less be built in tandem, which is a nice situation. And that's really why we wanted to get to that, kind of catch the two together is because it means you can just duplicate everything while it's fresh in your mind. You're kind of doing the same thing twice where it's, where it's easy to re remember what you've done before. So that's where we're at on that. Um, trying to think if there's anything else on this. I think Jonathan's just on with uh, machining the door handle components, which is going pretty cool. There were some really complicated bits that we were not sure how, how um, possible they would be. There's a slot where the lock barrel goes in, which we thought might have to be wire eroded, but he's actually managed to basically put a brooch tool in his CNC machine and actually broach it with the CNC. So that's uh, quite cool. Um, so yeah, we'll show you more of that when I get the parts for that. Uh, that's Jonathan Plumridge at uh, PBE CNC, who's doing some of our CNC machining work now. Um, so that's that. Uh, behind Jamie over there, in fact, I'll, I'll go this way, is the Land Cruiser, which I've literally just closed up, ready to go for a drive. Uh, I have been gassing the aircon on this which has been one of those things that's been kind of on the cards for a while. Finally got around to it. It's had a sli slightly frustrating first attempt in that um, I had it fired up because you know you have it running when you power up the compressor and uh, gas the aircon. Now, because it's the vintage air unit on the inside, there's obviously a refrigerant feed through the bulkhead to the inside. Now, unfortunately, one of the unions had been left slightly loose on the inside of the bulkhead. Um, but because of the noise of everything going on, and I was at the engine bay, I didn't actually hear that there was a leak. Um, so I was thinking, you know, it's been very slow to build up pressure on the, on the gauge, because it did, it vacuumed up okay, it held a vacuum fine. Um, it's just once it got under pressure. So, uh, yes, after a while, I, I thought something must be wrong. Yeah, I went and put, stuck my head inside and uh, noticed the trail of pag oil going down the transmission tunnel. So, uh, uh, thankfully, it wasn't spraying out everywhere. It was just dripping down and ruin, running down the tunnel. But anyway, uh, it was a dead easy fix. Tightened the fitting, went through the motions all again. Works really, really well. Actually, got loads of space for a big condenser on this. So, uh, you know, I was getting the vent actually with the, with the laser thermometer it was getting like minus two on the air temperature and condensation around the bezels of the vents which is uh, always a good sign so quite given the temperature at the minute i'm quite looking forward to going for some more test drives in that because it should be nice and uh, ice cold inside um, so yeah that's, that's basically what's left to go on that uh, and then morris um we i should have been out in that already this week unfortunately last time i tried to go out in it we had the wretched power steering problem return, which had been fine for absolutely ages. If you cast your minds back, we had uh, an issue with the pressure relief valve in the steering. It would basically stick open after you'd been revving the engine fairly high. So then when the revs dropped again, you'd have no power assistance because it would just be bleeding off all the pressure. Um, and we decided it must be some kind of small debris in the fluid. And we hadn't put a filter in it, which we often don't, um, but we put a filter in it, which seemed to sort it for a very long while. However, it did it again the other day, so we've just belt and braces, replaced the power steering pump on it, because the only thing we've really got left is that there must be some kind of manufacturing defect in either the plunger in the pressure relief valve or the ball that it runs in, although they look visually okay. Um, so we've replaced the pump. And hopefully, fingers crossed, that'll be ready to go. Um, James has been just doing a, a, a spar check on that um, since I've last been out on it, just to make sure all the nuts and bolts and everything, all the paint marks that we put on them still line up, um, which is all good. So I'm, that's ready for me to take out. So basically, I'm, I'm now the aircon's gassed on this, out in this, out in that. Um, on the subject of aircon, the Stratos is uh, lurking just outside behind you. Um, and I was going to battle, I was basically doing an aircon gassing session. So I was going to do this and then a Stratos, which that needs doing before we put, because to get to the compressor, you have to take the bulkhead panel out bit that sits behind the seats. So it's basically seats out, bulkhead panel out or the trim panel, then the actual sort of structural fill in panel. And you got access to the compressor, which we did to finish the plumbing. And I didn't want to put all that back in until we tested the AC in case we had some kind of leak back there. Um, now, as it is, we didn't have a leak back there, but I did have a leak elsewhere. Uh, we had a, a dodgy crimp on one of the pipes, which I've redone. But then more frustratingly, it appears there's a leak from the actual evaporator unit. Uh, I was thinking I can hear a hissing noise, um, but I can't see any of the points on the pipes leaking. And then I, a lot of feeling around. I could feel a little bit of gas coming out around the... Um, where the heater pipes go to the heater matrix, it's sort of in the bulkhead heater box, if you like. Uh, so yeah, frustratingly, I think that means we're gonna have to take that unit apart because I'm presuming there's some sort of damage to the evaporator core. Um, so watch this space on that one. Uh, actually going back to Escort, 
I'd forgotten, one of the things we've been working on is the handbrake. Uh, no idea. You probably can't hear that, viewers, anyway. There's <laughs> some very fantastic noise coming from the paint shop. Uh, so, handbrake, there's something on this. The, they've been doing the refurbs of the two handbrake assemblies for the escorts. Um, now, because the, the pivot is riveted on those handbrake assemblies, uh, it's it's <laughs> bizarre. Anyway, uh, the <laughs> total distraction. Uh, sounds like some sort of robot voice going off next door. God knows what it's saying. Probably something obscene. Knowing the body shop guys. Uh, <laughs> so so there's, it's a riveted pivot. So to get it apart to refurbish all the parts acceptably, we've basically got to grind that rivet out. So that's what we've done. The parts have then been, I don't know if they were painted or Xylan coated. I think there was Xylan actually. It might have been a combination of Xylan and plating. Uh, and then Jim's machined up a stainless steel uh, version of the rivet to basically peen back over, hand, hand rivet over and put the assembly back together. And then we've done something we've done on a few of these handbrake assemblies is that there's a metal button that releases it originally and it's just painted and it kind of scratches on the surround when you press it and it scrapes all the paint off and looks messy. So we remachine those in like a black acetal, kind of like a plastic material. Um, and then we've got the billet aluminium grips that we've had made for them as well. So it was just basically getting the handbrake assemblies completely stripped, refurbished with decent coatings on everything, remaking the button in plastic, uh, and then putting it all together, peening the rivets over. So those, those handbrake assemblies are ready to go in as well. So just kind of stepping forward through all the bits. Um, and actually right by my feet, there's a visual trigger for something, which is the trim panels. So we were doing a little trial. We've obviously made a lot of door cards in our time and uh, We've always done them by hand, and then we started thinking with one of the many things you realise you can do once you've got scanning uh, facilities, we thought, well, actually, we can just, if we scan the doors, we should be able to just draw these in a 2D CAD and then laser cut them out of the plastic. We use ABS uh, sheet to make them from, uh, and it seems to have worked extremely well. Um, the only thing we have discovered is that we did a scan of one door uh, for the drawing, assuming it would be exactly the same both sides, and actually the original holes where the clips go are in a slightly different position on one of the doors. Not that I should be surprised by that, I should have learnt over the years, but uh, yeah, we're going to probably have to do a separate drawing for the other door. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a win for laser cut um, ABS door cards. So that's one of the other things we're just on with, as you can imagine, um, with everything going on, sort of wiring wise, to then allow the rest of the build. One of the things on the cars is upholstery. So the seats are already over at Trimworks, uh, who's going to be doing the leather work and uh, upholstery on the seats. Um, so we're then following with various trim panels. So hence making these, there'll be the door panels, the two rear quarter trim panels. There'll be one sort of flat bottom panel in the back area there, a, a vertical one up against the bulkhead, the parcel shelf, which is two pieces. Um, Dean's already done the headlining, so that's a, like a charcoal Alcantara. I think that's pretty much what the interior panel work will consist of. And then there'll be the center console, which will be a fabricated upholstered piece with various machined aluminium inserts in it. Um, and then I think our plan is also to hand upholster, hand leather the cage. So like basically hand stitch leather upholster the, the roll cage in it as well. Um, oh, and on the subject of interior, Tom is just starting, but we'll probably show more on this next week. I think he's literally only just templating, but the dash pads, so the upper part of the dash will have an Alcantara upholstered pad where the four vents come through and the instrument pod will be in that. So he's just in the process of, of making those aluminium fascia panels so we can get them upholstered as well. Uh, so yeah, basically gearing up to do interior stuff. Uh, and I think on that, on that note, that's probably about it for in here. So we'll catch up with you next week for the latest uh, swearing at air conditioning gas episode. <laughs> we'll see you then.